Shalom, everybody. Welcome to Advanced Hebrew. Uh, this is week number eight. Uh, normally, the notes for this class you can find at theregathering.com, and if you are watching this as a recording, hopefully they will be there by then. If you are watching this live, my computer crashed this week, and so I have not managed to get those notes up, um, but I will do so as soon as possible. So until then, I'll do my best to explain things clearly so you can follow along. Like I say, those notes should be up by the end of the week, so you can follow along. If you're watching this as a recording, they're probably there already. Uh, and of course, all past classes and um, beginning classes, intermediate classes, you can find on YouTube at the Passion for Truth video channel. Okay, uh, one quick uh, bit of uh, housekeeping before I move forward. Last week, if you saw uh, the live version of last week's class. I believe that I misstated something, so I wish to correct that now. Um, I stated that uh, when you're using cardinal numbers and you're putting them in the uh, construct state, I believe that I actually said that masculine numbers take a tav at the end when they're put in the construct state. Um, I think I got myself confused because you use in, for numbers three and above, you use the feminine forms to modify masculine nouns. In fact, the masculine forms in the construct state will just under, they'll be spelled exactly the same as in their adjective state. They will just probably undergo a vowel change. The feminine forms, since all the feminine forms from three on up take a hey at the end, that hey changes to a tav. Okay, so that, if I said that, incorrectly last week. I'm correcting it now. The masculine forms in the construct state do not take a tav at the end. The feminine forms do. All right, so don't want to get you too mixed up with that. All right, um, so with that out of the way, we're going to move forward. Today, first thing we're going to talk about is a brand new binion. So we've been talking about verb conjugation. So we've talked about the present tense, the past tense, and the future tense. And the past and future are also known as the perfect and imperfect tense in ancient Hebrew. And uh, we've talked about various gizrot, like lamed he, lamed aleph, ayin vav. Today we're introducing a brand new binyan. The binyan that we've learned before was known as the pa'al. All right, and it's named after the third person, masculine, singular, past tense uh, form of the verb. This binion is called PL, and it is named after the third person masculine singular past tense form of its verb. Okay, now the, the binions will have gizrot within them, just like the pa'al had gizrot, the binion, uh, binion pa'al has gizrot, binion PL also has gizrot, they'll be the same as the gizrot and binion pa'al, so don't worry, you don't have to memorize a whole new set of gizrot. Um, but you will have to memorize the forms, not necessarily memorize, but know of the existence of. Uh, the different forms. Okay, so I don't have a complete list up here. When I get the notes up, there will in fact be a complete list that will have the past and the future in their entirety. For today, just to introduce the binion, I'm going to talk only about the third person forms. Okay, so if a verb is conjugated in the PL, instead of in the PAL, but in the PL, the third person masculine singular will have our first radical with a cheric underneath it, second radical with a dogish in it, and a tsera underneath, and then followed by the third radical. One of the defining features of binyan pl is that the second radical of the uh, verb will take a dogish. Okay, now you'll notice in the name pl itself, there's no dogish in the ion. That's because the ion cannot take a dogish. Okay, and, um, but, in cases where that second radical can take a dogish, it will. And so the, the masculine singular right, takes the dogish. The feminine singular, okay, first radical, cheric, second radical with a dogish, shva, third radical, comets, hey. Um, and I'll give some, um, some examples in just a minute to show an actual word conjugated in the peel. But in, you notice in all these cases, masculine singular, feminine singular, masculine plural, there's always this dogish in the second radical, which I've actually indicated by putting a dot in the, the two box there. Uh, that is one of the defining features of the PL. So don't forget that dogish. It's, uh, it's a great indicator of 
which uh, binyan you're in when you're looking at a verb. And uh, you'll notice that there is some parity with the pa'al. Okay, so we've got our basic uh, three radicals with no, in, no extra letters involved for our third person masculine singular. If you get out your sheet for the pa'al, you, um, you can compare these side by side and kind of see the correlation and see why I wanted you to, to memorize your pa'al sheet. Because it, you know, if you know that, then knowing just a few forms in another binion, you can kind of reconstruct the rest of them using the same rules. So, okay, so our third person masculine singular, it's just our basic thing, and we've got a basic vowel pattern that it follows. Chirik, tzera, and then a dagish inside the second radical. For the feminine, in the pa'al, of course, uh, it's, we've got a comets here, right? No dagish there, but a shva, comets, he. In the pl, we use our, our, uh, our vowel form, from here and add the comet say to the end. Now, of course, we've got a schwa here instead of a tzera. That's going to happen sometimes. There'll be vowel shortenings for various reasons. There's a little bit of memorization you do have to do. Okay, but this dagish in the second radical is a pretty good giveaway that we're in PL now. And for the third person plural, in PL it's the same as pa'al, that the, third per the past tense third person plural, there's one form for both masculine and feminine. Okay, and it uses the same suffix, the vav with the shuruk. Right? In the pa'al, there would be a comets here instead of a chirik, and there'd be no dagish in the second radical, but we would have the same suffix. Okay? So there's a lot of uh, overlap between the binyanim. Okay? Um, there's there's very, very similar patterns in the two. The main thing that changes between pa'al and pl is this vowel structure. And, of course, the, the dagish in the second radical. I'm emphasizing that because it's going to be there. So. so if we apply this to an actual word, um, apply this to an actual word, so let's use a root, shin, bait, resh. And I'm going to tell you in a moment what that actually means, but I just want to sub in the letters just for the sake of giving an example. So third person masculine singular in the PL. All right, we're subbing for our first, second, and third radicals. We're putting the appropriate vowels in. And our second radical takes a dogish. So this is she bear. All right, so in cases where the, our second radical is uh, is a letter whose sound changes when a dagish, dagish is introduced. You'll notice that change. Instead of shiver, in the pa'al that would have been shavar. In the pl it's shiber. Okay? And if we were to put this in the third person feminine singular, again, still in the past tense, shibra. Okay? Shibra. So, who she bear, he she bra. All right, so what does shabar mean? Actually, I'm going to hold off on that until I cover these forms because I need more board space to talk about that. So, I'm going to reroute just a little bit here. All right. So, I'm going to keep you in the dark for just a little longer, but I want to show the future tense. Future tense, we've got our same for the third person masculine singular. That's what we're looking at right here. I don't have it marked out, but this is third person masculine singular. Here's feminine singular, masculine plural, feminine plural. All right. Masculine singular, we have our regular yod prefix, just like in pa'al. But instead of a cholam, it's a shva. First radical with a comets, second radical with a dagish, and a tzera underneath it, and then finally our third radical. So using um, shin bait resh as our uh, pattern, it'd be yishaber. Okay, that's he will whatever shaber means. All right, feminine. We've got a tav, shva, first radical patach, second radical with dagish, tzera, and then third radical. So tishaber. 
All right? She will shaber. Okay? So notice that these prefixes are the same as in the pa'al. In the pa'al, third person masculine singular, future tense, we've got the yod prefix and then our particular vowel pattern. Then for the feminine singular, we, instead of the yod, we use our tav prefix, but we match the same vowel pattern later. Same way in the pl. So just as the pa'al, you know, the same way the pa'al matches its patterns throughout the different uh, persons, genders, and numbers, the pl follows suit. All right, it just uses a different vowel pattern to begin with. So it, the way it changes, you know, is, is uh, according to the grammatical needs. And same thing down here, third person masculine plural would be yeshabru, same prefix, same suffix as in the pa'al, okay, our yod prefix, and then our vav with shuruk suffix. Third person feminine singular, or rather, third person feminine plural, tishaber na, okay, same tav prefix, na suffix at the end. Okay, so, you know, there are seven different binyanim, there are numerous gizrot, but there's only so many patterns. And so if you memorize just a few of the basic patterns, you can kind of reconstruct uh, the rest of these binyanim. So it's not as much memorization as it seems, as long as you can remember certain patterns. So that's how I like to go about memorizing things, because I'm lazy, and I don't want to memorize every single form. Uh, but as uh, one of my engineering instructors told me in college, there's a strong correlation between laziness and efficiency. So. That's how I prefer to think about it. Um, but there are patterns that can actually be followed and they are a great memory aid to understanding what you're looking at. So if you, so again, if you haven't memorized the pa'al yet, I strongly encourage you to do that because if you've got at least that down, then you can kind of think through whatever you're looking at from another binion and say, okay, that's probably second person feminine plural. And in fact, you'd be right. Um, you know, because you can identify a lot of these forms from the prefixes and suffixes that are consistent through a number of the binyanim. So that's a, it's a, it's a good thing to know, and the pa'al is the most basic, easiest form to remember. So I really encourage you to do that if you have not already, because this PL is going to follow the same thing. And when I get the whole PL chart up online, you'll be able to see that. Okay, these prefixes and suffixes are all the same. It's just this vowel pattern in the middle that identifies it as being one binion or another binion. Okay, so that is the past and the future of the PL. And I want to also introduce the present. So this is the present participle. Um, now, this is very different looking from the PAL because the PAL present, if you'll recall, uh, so we've got masculine singular, feminine singular, masculine plural, feminine plural. Okay, following my, my usual pattern there. In the pa'al, we've got our first radical, vav with cholon, second radical, and then the rest of the word. In the case of the masculine singular, it's tsera, and then third radical. Okay, so using our shavar example, this would be shover. In the pl, it's totally different. Okay, so while the past and future follow this similar pattern, present is its only animal. So you kind of do have to memorize all the present forms of the binyanim. Uh, in the peel, it would be mishaber, which of course is nothing at all like shover. But you can still identify the root. All right, but it's got this mem prefix at the beginning. All right, and that mem does not mean from. Okay, the giveaway is the vowel. All right, mem, mem prefix will have either a cherik or a tzera. It will not have a shva. So that shva is a giveaway that we're dealing with a verb conjugation. Okay, so mishaber is our masculine singular. Feminine, now, there is actually a pattern, though, that does apply. Once you've already applied the, the pl prefix and the pl vowel pattern, the endings are the same as pal. So mishaberet, okay, remember the, in the pa'al, we would have that same ending, et, et. okay, shoveret, mishaberet, and I forgot to add my dogish here. The dogish stays in that second radical throughout, whether it's present, past, future, um, imperative, okay, there's other tenses as well, which we will get to eventually. Um, 
But uh, anyway, so Mishaber, Mishaberet, Mishabrim, and Mishabrot for the plurals, okay, just like the endings in the Pa'al. So again, we're just following this vowel pattern and adding the appropriate suffixes. But uh, this mem prefix is totally different, and this, you know, cholam is gone. So you do kind of have to memorize that as its own thing. But that's how you can identify the PL of a present tense verb. <clears throat> the dagish in the second radical is a great giveaway, and then our mem prefix at the beginning is telling you that it's present tense. Okay? So that is the structure of the PL. What's the purpose of the PL? All right, so uh, hopefully, uh, well, I'm just going to have to take it off the board. I don't have room, so you'll just have to remember the forms and take me at my word that I'm representing them accurately when I put them up here. So if we can conjugate a verb in the pa'al, why would we conjugate it in the PL instead? All right, because the PAL has different persons, gender, number, tense, all right, and the PL has all of those things too. So we're not changing any of those things. We're not changing the number, not changing the gender, not changing the tense. Um, so why, uh, you know, why have this different binion? Well, the binion changes the what I would call the nuance of the verb, or the sense of the verb, okay? So the pa'al is the basic meaning. So using the root that I had up here before, okay, shin, bait, resh, in the pa'al, This means to break. Okay? So if I was to say he broke 3rd person masculine singular past tense conjugation in the pa'al would be shavar. Shavar means he broke. Okay, binyan pl Instead of being the basic uh, sense of a verb, now it can do a number of different things, and uh, there are certain special cases where it changes the meaning of a, of a particular verb in a special way, but there, it's consistent how it does it. It's just certain words do have funny things happen to them when they're put into the different binyani. But in general, the most generalized way that I can express the change from pa'al to pl is that the PL puts the verb in the intensive form. So it sort of amplifies the meaning. So instead of to break, in PL it would mean to shatter. So it's one thing to break something. Okay, I can, I can break a, a pot, right? Or I can shatter it into hundred tiny pieces. Okay, that's, that's kind of the idea. It intensifies the action. So she bear would mean he shattered. It's a stronger implication than he broke. All right. To give another example uh, for the verb sha'al, or rather just shin ayin lamed, in the pa'al, okay. I'm sorry, it is in fact an Aleph. Shin Aleph Lamed, my bad. Okay. Sha'al means 
to ask. All right. And uh, I haven't gone over the, uh, the ion aleph. That's why I said ion, because it's the second radical. I haven't gone over the ion aleph gizra. Okay, gizrat ion uh, aleph, where the, the aleph holds the second position. Okay, but in that uh, gizra, it will be comets, comets, I believe. Actually, the Paul may not have a separate one. All right, I'll have to look that up. But in the PL, I do know this one. In the PL, the ion aleph makes this change, but it's still PL form. I just haven't gone over that gizra yet, but this is still the PL, third person masculine singular form. Okay, so she ale, it would normally be she ale, okay, but it's not, it's she ale because the aleph is in the second position, it's still a PL form. Okay, so in Pa'al it's to ask, in PL, she ale means to beg. So you see how that intensifies the original meaning. It's one thing to ask, it's another thing to beg. Okay, it just, uh, so the PL in general provides the intensive sense of the verb. So, and it's intensive uh, as contrasted to its pa'al form. Now it's worth noting that some verbs are never conjugated in the PL, they're only conjugated in the pa'al. And some verbs are never conjugated in the pa'al, they're only conjugated in the PL. So they only have an intensive form, they don't have like a lesser, you know, a lesser uh, iteration. And there's some verbs like shavar and sha'al that can be conjugated in both and you can see the contrast. Okay, so sha'al would mean he asked and she'al would mean he begged. Okay, so that's why these different binyanim exist, is to give different senses, different nuances of the verb. The base meaning is to break, Okay, but we can modify that a little bit to make it more intense and say to shatter, all right? So that is the contrast between the PL and the PAAL, and there are five more. So there's a lot you can do in Hebrew with just one root word. You can take that word and you can apply it, past tense, present tense, future tense, um, and all these different nuances, okay, just knowing a few rules, all right? But instead of memorizing all the words, you just know the roots and know the rules and the irregularities because there are some words that are irregular. But once you know all that, you can reconstruct pretty well the entire language. So, um, so anyway, that is my introduction to Binyan PL. Uh, Pa'al and PL are the most common uh, Binyanim that you're going to encounter, but you'll encounter all seven. Um, but yes, these are um, definitely the most common ones, and in the verses we're going to look up next class, you'll see both of them. So that's why I'm introducing it now. Okay. So I've got three big topics today. PL was one of them. The second one is um, a particular conjugation of a particular word. All right, this word, this verb, rather this root, he, yud, he, this is the most fundamental verb in the Hebrew language. It means to be. And in the pa'al, okay, I, I now have to specify which binion I'm talking about. I will default to the pa'al, but I'm always going to specify which binion I'm talking about when I talk about conjugating a verb, because we've got two to choose from now. Uh, this has an irregular uh, conjugation, and that's owing to a couple factors. One is that it's both a lamed he and an ayin yod. So, uh, the way those combine is a little bit funny. So I just want to cover the third person and first person forms uh, of 
this verb um, because we're also going to encounter those in the verses that we'll, we will be looking at and indeed in all probably every verse you ever look at will have this verb in some form in it because it's uh, it's everywhere okay so in the past tense third person masculine singular again if you're watching this live I don't have the notes up for this yet I will have them up as soon as possible and it will have a complete list of these so I'm, I'm just paring it down for the sake of uh, sake of time now but haya is the third person past tense masculine singular of to be haya means he was okay the feminine singular is haita. Hopefully you can see that online. All right? He yud tav he. Pronounced haita. So that's she was. The plural would be hayu. Okay, as I said, this is a um, This is just a particular way that this particular uh, shorish is conjugated. But you do need to know this or be familiar with it because you're going to encounter this word a lot in the scriptures and it has, a, has an irregular uh, conjugation. Okay, so the third person, past tense, all right, masculine singular is haya, he was, haita, she was, hayu, they were, whether masculine or feminine. Shurik. Vav with the Shurik, yes. So, hi, you. Okay, so that's. Hi, you. So, that's the third person. In the first person, I'm going to skip over the second person. But if you're going to say, I was. Again, and it's it's an irregularity. Hayiti is I was, and that's for masculine or feminine because in the first person it doesn't matter. And for we were, I'm sorry, no, no, that's right. Hayi knew, not hayi na, but hayi knew. Hayi T is I was. Hayi Nu is we were. Yes. So in the past tense, Hayya, he was. Hayta, she was. Hayu, they were. Hayi T, I was. Hayi Nu, we were. Okay? And I won't cover the second person uh, in the past, but these are the. Um, this irregular form of haya. So just, uh, again, I will have the whole list up so you can look at it, um, hopefully in a timely manner. Uh, tomorrow, the computer should be fixed. But, uh, okay, so that's the past tense. Future tense, third person, masculine, singular, is yihye, that's he will be. Okay, so actually I'll use my Zion and Nun like I should be. All right, feminine is tihye, she will be.
plural is yihiyu. Masculine plural, so they will be masculine is yihiyu. They will be feminine. Is tihiyena. That is a word you will not encounter very often, but that is the third person feminine plural of haya. Tihiyena. Okay. They will be. As I'm sitting here spelling that word, uh, that shiva on the top word, that yihi yit, I've got the yod and I've got the herring, that e from a yi. But then that H, that Shiva. Shiva is just a small pause right there. So that H is actually going, it's not going with a Y-I-H, is it? The Yo, Herrick, H. Mm -hmm. So if I was translating that, it's like I would have a Y, an I, and an H. Yes. And that's going to have a sound? Then when I come over to the Y-E-H, Yes, this hey makes a sound when it's at the beginning or middle of a word. It's silent at the end. So you will say yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You'll have that. See, I, I can't pull it out of the letters, so I'm doing something wrong with my letters. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the hey at the end is silent. Mm -hmm. Then when you came down to that one, that yee hee. Yee hee you. Yee hee. Yep, so, that, so that's the future tense, third person. Okay, masculine singular, feminine singular, masculine plural, feminine plural, and just for just for kicks, I'll include the first person also. Actually, yeah, there's a reason I included the first person. It was to go on a bit of a rabbit trail right here. First person singular in the future tense is eheye. And the plural, so that's I will be, eheye. And the first person plural, we will be, is nihiya. Okay. <clears throat> Ehiya and nihiya. <clears throat> so the reason I mentioned the first person at all, because I actually need to come back to the third person to make a particular point. But this ehiya right here, if you remember in Exodus 3, I believe it's verse 14, but somewhere in the teens, um, that's where we get the phrase, I am that I am, okay, when God is talking to Moses and, and Moses says, well, when, when I tell them, you know, that you've come to me, what, what shall I say, what God shall I say sent me, or what is, you know, what is your name is uh, the gist of the question, and he says, I am that I am. That's what's usually translated, but in fact, what is written is eheye asher eheye, which literally means... I will be what I will be, or I will be that I will be, not I am that I am. Um, now, there, I, there are various reasons that they translate it, I am that I am, but literally it's I will be what I will be. And um, one of those reasons is that haya, the verb to be, has no conjugation in the present tense. If you remember, the term is and are in Hebrew is invisible. We never write those words. They're just uh, inserted in the sentence based upon context. The present tense of to be would be is or are <clears throat> or am. There is no conjugation. You will never see this word conjugated in the present tense, ever. It doesn't exist. Uh, so this word, though, in any biblical narrative, Anytime you find a story, <clears throat> okay, not just a list of 
of numbers or, or anything like that, but a story, which most of the Bible is stories, it'll be introduced with this verb in some form. So when a story is taking place in the present tense or a narrative is taking place in the present tense, this verb's still there. It's just invisible because it doesn't exist in the present tense. Okay? <clears throat> so that, that's one reason they translated I am because they can't write I am any other way. Um, but in my humble opinion, I will be would be a better translation. Okay, not I am. Now that has theological implications for some people, which is probably why it's preserved in certain translations. I'm not going to go there. I'm just speaking strictly as a grammarian. Eheye means I will be. <clears throat> and in fact, the proof that it means I will be is that a few verses earlier in that very same chapter of Exodus, the very same term is used, and it clearly must be translated I will be. Okay, so. I'm not picking on the translators, I'm not picking on anybody, I'm just saying that grammatically speaking, eheye means I will be. All right? It is the proper first person singular future tense conjugation of haya. So that's all I'm saying and I'm going to leave it there. All right, on to my actual point about this, um, about this verb. I need to talk briefly about a new tense. and. Um, I'm going to just hash over it briefly. We'll cover it in more depth um, in a, probably next week or the, the week following, but I want to touch on it right now. There's another tense that is known as the jussive. Okay, so as opposed to the past, future, or present, this is known as the jussive. The jussive is just like the future tense. It's just like the third person future tense. But instead of being a statement about the future, it's a statement of desire about the future. So, um, so instead of saying, when haya is put in the future tense, okay, masculine singular, yihaya means he will be. It's a, it's a dry statement about future events. This is going to happen. But if we put haya in the jussive, masculine singular, then instead of saying he will be, we're saying let him be. Okay, let it be. In other words, it's a statement of intent or desire. Instead of saying it's going to happen, it's saying I want this to happen. Okay, so the jussive form of haya is this. Instead of yehye, it is Yehi. Okay. So Yehiyah means he will be. Yehi means let him be or let it be. Because <clears throat> the particularly with Haya, this business of gender doesn't always so much apply to people as it does to words that have either a masculine or feminine gender. Okay. So, let him be could very well be um, rendered let it be, okay, he will be, it will be, right? A lot of times we're talking about uh, objects that are either inanimate or don't have a gender when we're using these terms. <clears throat> we are frequently talking about people too, but um, remember in Hebrew all words have gender, so don't let the he's and she's throw you off too bad. You just have to remember to match your gender with your subject or with your, uh, yeah, match the gender of your verb with the gender of your subject. So, um, so as I said, we'll go over the jussive a little more in the future, but for right now, just know that um, it, it expresses intent or desire. And it's used in the third person. Okay, so it's just like the third person future tense, except it's expressing intent instead of uh, fact. Okay? So, yehi, remember this, this term. You're going to encounter it many, many times. All right, so that is the second of our three big, big topics. Now we are on to the third. Now, if things weren't confusing enough already, I've got a real fun one for you here now. And actually, this isn't all that confusing. It's just a little funny at first. 
I've talked about the vav prefix before, which means and. Now, normally, that just means and and no, uh, no extra problems. But in Hebrew, when the vav prefix is placed in front of a verb, okay, if it's placed in front of a noun, no big deal. But if, it's placed, if it is placed in front of a verb, um, a funny thing happens. When a vav prefix is placed in front of a future tense verb, it changes the verb to the past tense. Okay, so uh, for a future tense verb, let's just say um, he will come. Right. He will come is yavo. All right, that's our third person, masculine, singular, past tense, or uh, sorry, future tense in the pa'al. All right, our root is bait, vav, aleph, means to come. So this is, he will come. If we prefix this with a vav, First off, um, when the vav prefixes the future tense, it'll usually take a patach. So just be aware of that. And the yod will usually take a dagish. Not always, but it happens a lot. And in this particular case, I believe the vowel stays the same. I could be wrong. But the important part other than these nuances is that when we affix this to the front, this doesn't mean and he will come. It flips the tense. So this becomes and he came. Okay, so when the vav prefix is added to a future tense verb, it changes it to the past tense. Pronounced vayavo. Vayavo. So, yavo, he will come, vayavo, and he came. All right, so if we wish to add the vav to something, we wish to add our prefix and keep things in the future tense, all right, if we're already talking in the future tense about things that are going to happen and we want to keep things there, well, there's a way we can do that. Guess what it is? Ba would mean he came. If we're already talking, now there's a, there's a distinction to be made here. Anytime the vav is added to a future tense verb, it changes it to past automatically. When a vav is added to a past tense verb, it can change it to the future. Okay? So this can mean, and he will come. But when it's affixed to a past tense verb, it's actually dependent on context. Okay, and this isn't. Uh, this seems a little weird right now, but it's it's not as arbitrary as you might think. So. When we're speaking of a narrative, we're talking about a story, okay, so something's being spoken of or, or described. That story is going to unfold in one of the tenses. It's, it's going to either going to talk about something that happened in the past, or it's going to talk about something that's going to happen in the future, or something that's happening right now, although those are rare. Okay. So early on in the narrative, we'll have a verb that's either past tense or future tense, and it's going to set the tone for the rest of the story. All right, it's going to tell you, okay, we're talking about something that happened or we're talking about something that will happen. Once we're in that mode, 
the story is going to tend to stay there. Okay, so if we're talking about things that happened in the past, we're going to start most likely, um, well, we'll either start with a past tense verb or, or we'll start with a vav and then a future tense verb. But every verb that follows is going to have, when we're talking about the past, is going to have this vav future tense. Okay, so and this happened and that happened and that happened and that happened and he did this and she did that. Okay, we're always going to have this continuity with the vav and then our future tense form, but it means the past tense. Okay, that's going to just be very consistent. But we're already talking about the past tense at that point, so it just, it just kind of rolls over. And um, now, if we're talking, so in the case that we're already talking about the past tense, when we encounter something like this, it stays in the past. It's not going to flip it over. All right, so if this begins the narrative, or if it's in the middle somewhere, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stay past tense. Only if we're already talking about the future tense will this vav on the past tense flip it around. So if we start in the future, saying, ah, he will come. If we say later, and he will come, if we're just being redundant for some reason, then we can interpret this as being future. So whatever tense you're in, it's going to tend to stay there. So in, when we add the vav to a past tense verb, you have to pay attention to the context to know if it's going to flip the tense or not. Every time it's attached to a future tense verb, it flips the tense. It always changes the future tense to the past. It can change the past to the future, but not necessarily every time. It's context dependent. Okay? So anyway, this is a funny thing about the vav. We call this the vav that inverts, because it inverts the tense from future to past or from past to future. This is a very, very, very common thing in the scriptures, uh, because the scriptures are a lot of stories put together, and they're written in a narrative form, and this vav is what connects the different parts of the narrative together. All right, and so there's a whole lot of this tense flipping that happens. So uh, you have to pay real close attention to what's going on, and you have to know your tenses really well to catch uh, to catch all these flips and changes, and you know switching from this to that. It's a little perplexing at first, but as long as you know that this happens and you know your forms, you can catch it as it occurs. And like I say, the tenses are going to stay consistent. You're not going to suddenly flip from past to future and future to past. Well, you will when people are talking because you can have a past tense narrative where people are talking about the future. So the people will be using future tense terms even though it's, the whole story is written in the past. Actually, that happens in Genesis 1, incidentally. But... Um, but generally speaking, it's, it's going to stay, as parts of the narrative, things are going to stay in the same tense throughout. So that's your clue when you're not sure what tense you should use. Just look at the tenses that are used all around. Okay, unless it's an interruption where somebody's speaking, you're gonna, it's going to stay consistent. But this vav will invert. It's called the vav that inverts. It flips the future to the past. It can flip the past to the future. Okay, so be aware of that vav. You'll see it all over the place. All right. Any questions about um, any of the topics I've just covered? Okay. All right. So to briefly recap, I've talked about binyan pl, which gives the intensive form of the verb. Okay. So in contrast to the pa'al, which is the simple form, the PL is the intensive form. All right. The verb haya has an irregular conjugation. All right. It follows its own specific pattern. So you need to be familiar with that. And the vav, when it's placed in front of a verb, can flip the tense from future to past and sometimes from past to future. Okay. So these are three things that we will need to know before we start uh, translating. Okay. On that note, uh, this is week eight of the advanced class, the final week of advanced Hebrew. Our next class is going to be called translation. And so if you're watching this live, um, translation is going to be aired at three o'clock. There will no longer be a class at two. There's only going to be a class at three. That'll be translation. Um, uh, if you 
So, you know, you can watch beginner, intermediate, and now all of the advanced on YouTube and translation will be going live. Those will be recorded in and posted as, um, as they're, you know, as we go through them. So those will be on there too in time. Uh, but anyway, yes, the next class will be called translation. What we're going to do in translation is take verses that I know we can translate based on the things we've already learned in beginner, advanced, uh, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. So using all those rules and, um, and that vocabulary, we're going to use those things to translate some verses. I'll also be introducing some new concepts as we go along as needed to fill in the gaps uh, and to point out specific things about the verses. Um, but anyway, so this is going to be where all of this theory is finally put into practice. So I'm real excited about it. Uh, it should be a fun thing. That's probably why you're learning Hebrew in the first place, is to be able to translate some things. Um, I do want to point out that you don't have every single tool necessary to translate every Bible verse at this point. Okay, I've specifically included things that are geared towards specific verses. Hopefully I've, I've covered enough that um, we can use this in translation, and then after that you have a really good base if you want to pursue a more advanced Hebrew curriculum. You've got a good base, you not kind of are familiar with some of the terms, you're familiar with some of the rules, and you kind of know where another curriculum is going to be going. And uh, hopefully I've given you a view of the forest of Hebrew, and so then you can focus in on the trees and not lose sight of the big picture. You know, you know why you're focusing on specific things and why you're learning all these particular uh, rules. And um, so, anyway, so this whole course is by no means comprehensive. Um, although I'm not going to say there may not be future classes that delve a little deeper into some things. But, um, but anyway, it's, it's just meant to be kind of a survey course to give you an overall picture and introduce you to some, to some basic concepts so you kind of know where things are going if you choose to go even further. But I don't want to leave you just without using it at all. I do want to get into some translation so you can see it in action see these rules in action, and see how it applies to actually interpreting uh, the Hebrew Scriptures. So I'm real excited about that. And um, if anyone's wondering, I'm not going to cover any Scriptures that are particularly uh, controversial. Um, I'm doing that on purpose because I'm not a theologian. I'm just teaching Hebrew grammar. Okay. So, uh, but it does give you a good basis uh, you know, for going forward. And knowing these things, you can then look through some other scriptures, and when you see something you don't recognize, all right, you might be able to track down, okay, this comes from such and such binion, or this comes from this, or it comes from that. It gives you, this will give you a basis anyway where you can uh, move forward. But as I said, next week, 3 o'clock translation, and uh, there will be eight weeks of that. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, the notes for this class will be up ASAP, and I'll refer you to those next week. Uh, so until then, shalom everybody, and we'll see you later.